Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask that you rise and find your Bibles and turn to Joshua 1. And we are going to read together verses 1 through 9 this morning. If you have it, say amen. amen. If you don't have it, find it and, or look at the screen. And it reads, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go, to, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. As I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea towards going down of the sun shall your territory. No man, somebody say no man, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to the, this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Somebody say amen. Amen. Praise God for his word. Father, we thank you, O oh God, for your word. I thank you for this word that has hit my heart far before it has to come out my mouth today. I ask that you would anoint me to deliver it just the way that you have, have ordained it on this day, O oh God. I pray that you be glorified and nothing else, O oh God. Prepare our hearts not to receive my thoughts, O oh God, but to hear your voice. Meet us at our greatest point at our greatest need this morning until the soul the soil of our soul so that the seed falls on good ground and will not be so easily snatched away from us in this very moment oh god change us together change us so that we could have a collective voice oh god in our homes in our families on our jobs in our businesses that we together will reach the world we together will make disciples, and we together will release the kingdom. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. As you sit down, tell somebody, I see termination dust. No, y'all. Listen, I had nothing to do with the weather this morning. I am not God. So don't y'all start, don't y'all start. But look at the other neighbor, because that first neighbor was a little shady. Look at them and say, I see termination dust. I see termination. Amen, praise God. Absolutely. And this morning, we really saw some termination dust up there. It was a little rainy, but we was driving, coming down International, and I told my husband, is that snow on the mountains? He said, yeah. I was like, well, thank you, Lord. Confirm it however you got to confirm it in Jesus' name. But we're going to go over before we start just a little bit of Alaska lingo. This is a territory, the land that God has given us. And so there are some things that we say in Alaska that we have to understand. If we talk to people who live in the South or on the East Coast, they have no idea what we're talking about. And I didn't realize that. When I go visit my family and I say lower 48, they're like, who's, who's lower 48? I say, you, you lower 48, right? Because the lower 48 are all the states joined by the U.S. and the Washington, D.C., except for Alaska and Hawaii. 
They don't understand what the alcan is. What's the alcan? Who knows what the alcan is? Alaska Canadian Highway. What about a Ulu knife? The Ulu knife, yes, they are these Alaska native half moon kind of all purpose utility knives. Some of them are beautifully adorned on the handles and they have all these carvings. A Ulu knife. What about the bush? If someone says I'm going to the bush, Yes, all the smallage villages. It refers to the large portion of Alaska that's not accessible by road. To reach the villages in the bush, you have to take alternative means of transportation, such as airplanes or boats in the summer or snow machines in the winter. Somebody said, we have the state of Alaska. Say it with me. Say, we have the state of Alaska. That means we're going to the bush. Y'all was shaky again. I love y'all anyway, but we are going to the bush because this state belongs to us. Amen? What about black ice? Yeah, oh yeah, black ice refers to the thin coating of glazed ice on the surface, especially on roads. Sometimes it's called clear ice. And most often you don't know that black ice is there until you need to know that black ice is there. Y'all drive the speed limit. We love y'all. Y'all get here safely. What about studs? Studs, studded tires. These are tires that literally have little metal studs embedded in them. The studs are de designed to dig into the ice, which provides an extra traction if needed on icy roads. Um, what about gold nuggets? It's, you don't know that one? Does anybody know what a gold nugget is? Yes, they're naturally occurring pieces of native gold. They're in clumps, and I've seen watches and rings and necklaces and jewelry made of gold nuggets. What about moose nuggets? Look at your neighbor and say, moose nuggets are not gold nuggets. You're going to need to know the difference between them. Yes, moose nuggets are moose droppings, so we don't want any confusion. Got to get that clear. Right up the bat. What about bear insurance? Does anyone in here have bear insurance? There's two types. One is typically a gun, that's a 357 or larger. And the second type of bear insur insurance is that you're always with somebody that runs a little slower than you. God bless y'all. Don't be somebody's bear insurance. The tracks are still open. Y'all get out there, get your run game up. We don't want that bear insurance. What about a PFD? Look at the saints. Everybody knows what a PFD is. A PFD is a permanent fund dividend. It's a dividend paid to Alaskan residents that have lived within the state for a full calendar year and intend to remain an Alaskan resident indefinitely. I copied that one from the website because some of y'all been saying y'all leaving. Stop it. You knew what all these phrases are, which means you are Alaska. Stop. You're not moving right now. Just join in with us. Let that check hit the bank and say, glory to God, we have the state of Alaska. Amen. Also among that is termination dust. It's an Alaskan thing. It's the first visible snowfall that dusts the mountaintops in the fall. The term began back in the 1940s during the construction boom, and it signaled the end of the cruise seasonal jobs. Once they saw the termination dust hit, they knew we only have a little bit longer to work before we are now out of work for the season. Nowadays, it's used to refer to the first snowfall signaling the nearing of the summer season. It's a sign or warning to brace yourself because change is coming. For the purpose of this sermon this morning, termination dust is going to signify aspects of change. The changing of time, the changing of leadership, the changing of jobs, the changing of homes, the changing of assignments, the changing in family, the changing in focus, the changing of relationships, the changing of attitude, the changing of seeds. It's just change. Somebody say termination dust. Change as a noun is defined as the act or instance of making or becoming different. The substitution of one thing for another, an alter alteration, a modification, or a new, freshly different experience. 
Synonyms for this word change are adjustment, advancement, development, revisement, shift, we heard that, shift, switch, transformation, metamorphosis, and refinement. Somebody say termination does. No matter where you are or what's happening around you, the one thing you know is change will eventually happen. A lot of times it can be voluntary. It can be something that we choose. It's initiated by us, like a new hairdo. Did y'all notice? Did y'all notice? Okay. A new hairdo, a new car, weight loss. Sometimes people choose to go into retirement. That's all a voluntary change. Then there's an involuntary change. That's beyond our control. We live in a military town, so military PCS. When the government tells you pack up, guess what? You got to suit up. We all have to adjust to that change. Sometimes there's a change of losing a job or the death of a loved one. That is not a change we choose. It's an involuntary change that's beyond our control. Whether categorized as good or bad, one thing is certain change will occur. Some people resist it. They, they, they don't want change to happen, but they're... No change is cause for a great concern. If we were to mix up a cake batter, a 7-Up cake batter, my husband's going for no sweets for a while, so I might have to get one in the oven today. Mix it up and put it in the oven. But if I were to put that in the oven for the allotted time and I pulled it out and it was the same form that I put it in at the beginning, there would be a need for cause for concern, right? We're expecting that to change form. What if we had a baby, and the baby year after year after year after year, the baby never grew up. The baby still cluster fed and woke up at one and two and three and four and five and six. It would be the, everyone shaking their head, no, 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 no. At some point, you expect that baby to mature and for change to happen. What if we worked on a job for 20 years and our pay never changed? Uh-huh, got a little response there. The same amount of money we make at year 20 is the same amount of money we started at at day one. Would there be a need for concern? Oh, yeah, somebody said absolutely, absolutely. What about if March, April, and May came and the snow never left? We headed into June with the same old slushy, what's going on, there would be a need for concern because we know change will occur. Somebody say termination does. Bishop Smith visited with us a couple Sundays ago and I was sitting in between Minister Lawanda and Rachel and when he said Joshua 1, I was stunned, literally. <laughs> I looked at both of them and I'm like, that's my scripture. That's right where God is dealing with me at, and that's right the word that I knew that he had given for us. So I was like, what's going on? And I'm grateful for our pastors because Pastor Tommy told me there's something else God must want to tell us. So I don't know who in here outside of me needs to settle in this change and transition, but we need to adjust. Change is coming. Amen? Amen. With the ter termination dust that accumulates on the mountain, the moment we see it, some people, they begin to complain because they know the snow is coming. They want to make it come down a little slower, and they want it to not arrive for as long as possible. This reminds me how sometimes we can ask God for a change. We want him to move in our lives. We want him to make rough situations good, and we want him to make good situations better. But the moment we sense transition, especially those beyond our control, or when it is arriving differently than we thought it would be, we resist the very thing that we ask God to give us. Proverbs 16 and 9 tells us that a man plans, but who orders the steps? The Lord. The Lord orders the steps. Sometimes this is because a lot of people are interested in changing situations and we're interested in changing circumstances, but we are not interested in changing our hearts. God is in the business of change. We are consistently going through change and transitions and processes as a believer. It's a necessary part of being a believer. 
2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Romans 12 and 2 tells us, And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you will prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Somebody say termination does. Change is not always about the end result. It's not always about the destination. It's not always about the thing that God is trying to get us to. One of the things that I, it it made me consider when I was um, studying on this is that healing in the Bible happened a very, a a lot of different ways. Um, Why did Naaman have to dip in a muddy, a dirty, muddy river seven times when just a word alone was enough for the servant of the centurion officer? Yes, it's about the process. It's not about the destination. God is a healer. Healing is what he does. Healing is our inheritance, so it had nothing to do with the end result. It had to do with the transformation and the byproducts that needed to be reproduced in the process. Somebody say, termination does. An observation that I had when I look up at the mountains and see the termination does is that sometimes it seems inconvenient for us who aren't ready for it. Seasons happen here on earth, the summer, spring, fall, when we all live in the state of Alaska, when summer comes, it comes for us all. When winter comes, it comes for us all. It don't fall on the east side and the west side of Anchorage is still sunny and flip-flops. When the snow hits, typically, guess what? It hits. We experience it all. But in the seasons of our lives, we will all go through them, but they may not arrive at the same time. So one day as I complained about seeing termination dust and a rainy day, the rainy season we was in, there was a sister who shared with me. She said, you know what? I pray for rainy days. And I said, why would you pray for rainy days? Like, she said, because I have bad allergies, and the only relief that I get in the summertime with the pollen is on a rainy day. So when it rains, for me, that's when I'm heading outside to be able to enjoy nature because those are my days of relief. And since then, I've learned to appreciate the change of seasons, even when it feels like an inconvenience or a disadvantage to me. Ecclesiastes 3 and 1 says, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Seasons of life aren't like seasons of the earth. So I'm not threatened when I see somebody else's season taking place because I bless the blesser, which means if your day is coming, that's just a guarantee for me that my day is on the way. It makes me think about the movie Independence Day, not the new one, but the old one, the Will Smith one back in the day. And I think about how they had these big alien ships that were over major cities across the world. And in that instance, there was not the United States, there wasn't Russia, there wasn't China, there wasn't Egypt. There was mankind as one who was fighting a common enemy. And once they found out in the U.S. how to defeat the enemy, I heard one of the commanders say, get on, get on the whatever they were communicating with and let all the squadrons know all the way around the world how we got our victory. Now, I can imagine someone in Egypt getting the information that the U.S. just defeated the enemy that they were looking at. They were looking at it. They didn't have to wait to get excited about their ship coming down because they knew it happened over here. So victory for one of us meant victory for all of us. So it took a minute for the movie to pass and then you saw them jumping and all the ships around everywhere had come down and they had all gained the victory. But victory started with just one. So when we look at each other, your good day is my good day. Your victory is my victory. Your new job is my new job. 
Your new season is my new season. Your healing is my healing because we are, we are one. Amen. Even as the farmer plants, when they plant on their plantations, one of them plants the crops. Another one may be to the stage where they're tending to the crops. And another one may be at a stage where they're harvesting their crops. The planter who is planting the crops doesn't have to look over and be concerned about what the other is harvesting. Because chances are, we are all right in this area. If harvest came for you, guess what? Harvest is coming for me as well. Again, if one of us gain victory, all of us gain victory. The book of Joshua is about change. It marks the end of one period of Israel's history and the beginning of another period. This book takes place after the death of Moses and begins with the new leader, Joshua, leading the nation of Israel into Canaan. After 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, Israel is about to take possession of the land God promised Abraham way back in Genesis, many centuries ago. Joshua and the Israelites were about to encounter change. Change has been prophesied to this house even just a couple of weeks ago when Bishop Smith came and he was telling us about that shift and we are just one, one crossing away. And I know what I feel down in my spirit and talking with my sisters and brothers as we live life among each other. Everyone's like, we, we just write like you can feel it. You know we are right on the brink of God's promises for us. And I'm excited about that. It is important, though, that as we are preparing for our next season that signifies change, that we make a, a strong difference between a season and a cycle. We all feel the anticipation of what's coming, and some of us is going to make the jump into the season and go on, while some of us are just going to make a jump and we're going to go in the same cycle. There's a difference. Look at somebody and say, a season is not a cycle. And a cycle is not a season. I declare it's our new season. Amen? Amen. Physical termination dust signifies the need for preparation. I know when we see the snow, whether you want to be excited about it coming or not, y'all saw it on the mountains this morning. If you didn't, look when you come out. It's, it's a little bit on there. But you better start looking through your stuff. You better start digging out those stud tires if you have them. I know somebody's head went back. Y'all better start making sure you got some ice melt. You better make sure you know what shovels, because you know you broke your shovel last year and you just threw it in the garage because you figured you had all summer to get a new one and you didn't get a new one, so you better look into that right now. You better make sure your kids have both boots and both gloves and that they fit because it's horrible if it comes on Monday and they got to go to school and they can only find one boot. It's just going to set your Monday up not the way you want it. So sometimes looking and seeing the elements of change that are happening, there's something that we have to do to, to prepare and to be ready for what is coming our way. As we read the text, note there is one thing that God mentions over and over and over in Joshua 1, 1 through 9. He says, be strong and courageous. Three times he admonishes Joshua to have courage. I see that there are some preparations that we have to make. If we look at verse 6, it says, be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. This reflects stewardship. I didn't originally think so, but then I looked at what stewardship was, and it's defined as a job of supervising or taking care of something such as an organization or a property. Luke 16 and 10 says, he, is he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And it goes on to say, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. I heard someone talk about 
what they thought about that scripture very recently, actually this past week. And they said growing up, they quoted that scripture incorrectly. They memorized it wrong. And they said, he who is faithful in, in what is least, that he will be made faithful in what is most. Is that what it says, though? It doesn't. It says, he who is faithful in what is, is least is faithful also in what is much. So this lets me know I can't wait till the promise comes to get it together with my stewardship. I have to be a good steward now. I mean, we, God has promised us some things, and a lot of times it's easy to think about just money, but God has promised us jobs, and God has promised, there has been just the word that has gone up, the promises that we know that God has made us, and we have to make sure, are we, are we able to manage what we have asked him for? We can't wait till it gets here to find out this is way too much, which means there's something we've got to start executing and doing right now to prepare for the change that's coming. Somebody say termination dust. Termination dust, amen. If you are stuck and ready for your next season, but are stuck in the cycle for turning to your stewardship, I say to you, as God said to Joshua, be strong and be of good courage. I heard um, Elder Raby say this morning to course correct. That means if if we're identifying something that's not right or we need a challenge to be better in an area, we can't keep, they said to keep doing the same thing over and over is just insanity. If we want a different result, we want the byproducts and the fruit of God's promises, then we've got to do exactly what the word of God is telling us to do. So adjust to the dust. Say adjust to the dust. Amen. Change is coming. The second time God mentions courage was in verse 7. In verse 7, he was referring to the courage required to keep the law, disregarding all of the pressures to compromise. Verse 7 says, only be strong and very courageous. All the pressures to compromise according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left hand that you may prosper wherever you go. And then further in verse 8, it says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. I remember Pastor Tommy declaring over this body for us to be a mature body. A mature body. That means that we will have to do as Matthew 6 and 6 says, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you shut your door, pray to your father who was in in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Also, in Matthew 6 and 33, it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And in Psalms 119 and 11, it says, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's time for more than a Sunday morning high and a Monday morning low. That's a cycle. I am not interested in cycles. I am ready for my season. Can, is anybody else ready? Like, I am ready for my season. And the thing that gets me about my season is I know how good I have imagined it in my mind. But the Bible says his ways are above my ways. That means I can't even think of it good enough as how he's going to bless me. So it just makes me excited and makes me determined that I will not make this next season a cycle. This is my new season. Amen. Simply wanting a more intimate relationship with God isn't enough to make it happen. Simply wanting to spend more time with God isn't enough to make it happen. If you are ready for that next season and you are stuck in the cycle pertaining to your intimate time with the Lord, I want to encourage you to recognize and to address your distractions. 
For me, it's certain rooms in my house. I can say I'm going to read my Bible in a certain room, but I guarantee you oxygen will be on in just a minute. So I've had to literally pick up and to go into another room just so that I know I'm being very intentional that this time is carved out between me and my father. So recognize and address your distractions. Don't let all the urgent things crowd out the important things. There's always something to do. There is always, when there's nothing to do, we look for stuff to do because we just can't believe there's nothing to do. But the important things should be priority. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And the last one I would say is know that discipline does not negate delight. The more you spend time with the Lord, the better. Boy, I'm telling you, you will be like, I'm going to wake up just 30 minutes before I have to get ready for work. And the next thing you know, I'll be like, I got to make it 45 because I'm going to be late because it's so good. I just don't want to turn it loose. So the more you spend time with God, the more you will want to spend time with God. So just know that discipline does not negate delight. The third time he mentions and spoke of courage was in verse 9. He said, be strong and of good courage. He emphasized this message. He was communicated by repeating it, and then he reworded it. He told him to be strong and of good courage, and he said, do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. In this verse, the conclusion of this whole speech was for God to assure Joshua and to alleviate his fears. The more we stand in God's love, his perfect love, fear must go. Perfect love, the Bible says, cast out all fear. Across the river, God knew that they had a very formidable enemy. The 10 spies had been right in their report in Numbers, Numbers 13 and 30, talks about how they said, indeed, there were populous. Indeed, they had chariots in the walled cities. Indeed, there were giants among them. But Caleb said, let us go at once and take the city, for we are all able. I'm sorry, for we are well able, well able to overcome it. They were standing with signs of termination dust all around them. They were standing on the brink of God's promises to be manifested. And in our text, we find that God promised them that they were to see the promise of victory over the enemy, the promise of the presence and the power of God in their lives, the promise of the faithfulness of God. They were there to see the promise of absolute victory, and they were they received a promise that God keeps his promises. That's a promise on a promise. That's what was promised to Joshua. And I remind you that the same promises that God made to Joshua are still valid for us today. I saw the, the, the first, a couple weeks ago was the first time I saw termination dust on the mountain. It came down a little bit and I did exactly what I talked about. I was like, no, was it this time of year? I guess so. I mean, we've had a beautiful fall, but the snow melted away. God's promises are not like that snow. They're there. Whether we see them, whether we don't see them, it doesn't move us because his promises are there. God is a constant. And it's so funny that when we're dealing with this termination dust and transition and change in our lives, the only way to get through a change is to deal with the constant. I don't even sound right, but the only way for me to really step into this next new season, this shift, this transformation, is to really rely on the constant. Malachi 3 and 6 says, for I am the Lord, I do not change. Hebrews 13 and 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. James 1 and 17 says every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Numbers 23 and 19 says God is not a man he should lie, that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. He has said, has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Genesis 8 and 21 and 22 says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, 
winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Even in that scripture, that happened in Genesis when God made a covenant with Noah, a promise that he would never again destroy the world with water. So every time we see the seasons change from one thing to another, it's remind, it should be a reminder to us that this is God's promise. He keeps his word. So it may rain, y'all, but it ain't never going to rain because God has kept his promise to us. We can still count on the very things for the Lord to do that he promised for them, that he promises to us. It's, God promised them that he, gave, he would give them victory over all their enemies. 1 John 5 and 4 says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That means victory over my, all my enemies belongs to me. It wasn't just for Joshua way back when, but it's for me and mine and you and yours. Because when one of us gain victory, all of us gain victory. He is an ever-present help is for us. Hebrews 13 and 5 says, For he himself has said, I will never leave you. Or forsake you. Matthew 28 and 20 says, Lo, I am always with you, always, even to the end of the age. Psalms 46 and 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. Praise God, He is always present. God is faithful. That was a promise back to Joshua, and that's a promise for me. Deuteronomy 7 and 9 says, Therefore, Know that our Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keeps his commandment. Are you a commandment keeper? Because that's a promise for me for generations to come. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, which is one of my favorite scriptures. Through the Lord's mercy, we are not consumed. No, I'm sorry. Thank you. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 24 says, He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. That is our promise that God is faithful to do this. We are still talking about change, but we have to know what we're going into change with for our success. He gives us victory. 2 Corinthians 2 and 14 says, now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 and 57 but says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the last one says he, ke- he still keeps his promises. Romans 4 and 21 says, and being fully convinced that what he has promised, he was also able to perform it. He wasn't like people who say they're going to do something and they don't have the means to be able to provide us what they say. If he said it, He's more than able to do it. It is already done. We are at that threshold of change. We are standing on the brink of promises. Our next steps are so significant because these are the steps that are going to show where our heart is in our relationship with the Lord. Because remember, Joshua is getting all this reminding about be strong and courageous, but he was one of the ones in numbers who said, we could do this. Like, they are big, but my God is bigger. We are well able to overcome this. In this regard, change is like a yellow light. Once you're approaching it, you've got to make the decision if you're going to speed up, embrace yourself, and go to the next place, or if you're going to slam on your brakes and stop and enter another cycle. Because a season is not a cycle, and a cycle is not a season. Work in me, I've been empowered to 